to be here with you today. Let's open our usual way, please. Repeat after me on the screen. I open my heart to receive from the Word of God. God's promises are true. There it is. And they are true for me. There it is. Sorry, I was a little slow on the clicker there. Um, what I'm about to preach is true for you. It's true for anybody that would believe. Amen. So I've got a question right out of the chute. I want to ask you, who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that Jesus is? That's a good question. It's such a good question that Jesus asked his disciples the same question. In Matthew 6, we see that discourse. Jesus uh, came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked them, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this is not re was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So in this story, Peter answered correctly, didn't he? However, Jesus told him that he didn't get this answer on his own, right? He got it, it was revealed to him by the Father in heaven. And that's the key, revelation from the Father in heaven, revelation by the, by the Holy Spirit. That's one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we try to interpret, when we try to view Jesus in our own flesh, we may come up with a different answer. We may have a tendency to, to, look, to look at him through our own lens, to make him palatable for our own sensibilities, right? What do I mean by that? That's some big words there. I just simply mean that we oftentimes, in, our, in and of ourselves, that we want to make him into something that we're comfortable with. And isn't that the world that we live in today? It's all about watering things down, making things a lot more pluralistic. We don't want to offend anybody. Well, I mean, and recently um, uh, somebody in our Celebrate Recovery gave a, gave a uh, testimony and used the analogy of the boiling frog. <laughs> And uh, did you know that it's proven that if you put a frog in boiling water, he's going to try to jump out. You know, that's duh, right? But if you put a frog in a, in, in a pot in water that's lukewarm, room temperature, and slowly turn the heat up, slowly, very, very slowly, that frog will get used to the water and stay in the water all the way up until the boiling point and stay in there and boil to death. And as crazy as that sounds, I really believe that that's a picture of the world that we see today. It's, it's we, people being comfortable with things. And, and, and it's like, well, I don't know. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna go too far that way. I don't wanna go too far that way. We try to pick and choose. We wanna make Jesus and any other thing that resembles our religion palatable, uh, easy, easy going down, right? Don't require too much of me, in other words. But that's not who he is, is he? He is not a Messiah of our making, is he? So I just submit to you that Jesus is God's son. Jesus is God's son sent by God. That means he is a Messiah of God's making. Amen? <laughs> and that means that he is exactly who God, through his word, said he is. And I believe the world needs to hear that today. Maybe we, we need to hear that today. So again, I will ask you, who do you say, who do you say that Jesus is? Because I just propose to you that no one that ever, that has walked the face of the earth, has impacted humanity like Jesus Christ. Nobody that had an encounter with him in the Gospels ever left that encounter the same way. Would you agree with that? He is still today the, most, the single most influential person in recorded history in terms of influence on people, culture, governments, ethics, education, and even entertainment. Even our calendar. Did you know our calendar is based on his birth. B.C. literally means before Christ, right? A.D. means Anno Domini, which is Latin for in the year of our Lord. Magazines, Time, Newsweek, U.S. News and Report have had Jesus on their cover over 25 times. Time magazine alone has had covers related to Christianity more than 65 times. H.G. Wells, anybody know who he is? <laughs> the author Known for such works as The Time Machine, The Invisible Man, War of the Worlds. He wrote a 1,200-page work entitled The Outline of History. Wells was a Darwin supporter. 
by no means a believer in Jesus. Upon completion of this manuscript, he himself was startled to find out that there were two pages devoted to his hero, Plato, but a total of 41 pages devoted to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Larger than any other historical figure in his work. Whether you love him, whether you hate him, whether you're indifferent about Jesus, you must do something with Jesus Christ. Amen? He is a polarizing figure like none other in history. In the culture we live in, have you ever noticed that people these days, they don't have a problem with the notion of, of, of spirituality or even a God, whatever that is, as long as you don't get too crazy with it, right? But I tell you what, you mentioned the name Jesus Christ, and that's where the line's drawn. Wars are waged uh, because of the name of Jesus Christ. Controversy brews. So again, I ask you, who do you say Jesus is? Okay, let's have some fun. Putting aside uh, the spiritual aspects of the question, let's look, at this, let's look at some empirical data. You know me, I kind of nerd out on things like this now, now and then. I'm an engineer as well as being a pastor. Let's talk numbers. There are many Old Testament prophecies written regarding the coming of Jesus, the coming of the Messiah. Prophecies written thousands of years ago. Let's take a look at some of these prophecies. You've you that have been around me long enough, you've probably heard this before. I just, every once in a while, I give my old silver dollar thing, you know? You're about to hear it. It's been about a year and a half, by the way. I keep track of all these things. So here it goes. Let's talk about eight prophecies. I said there are hundreds of prophecies. Let's talk about eight prophecies. What are the odds that a man could come and fulfill eight prophecies spoken hundreds, if not thousands of years prior to that? The, the, uh, this is a number that has been proven accurate by the uh, American Scientific Affiliation. And this is what it looks like. Just eight prophecies, particular prophecies fulfilled by one person is, the odds of that are 1 in 10 to the 17th power. What does that mean? I didn't know there was going to be math today, Pastor. Well, okay, you're getting the full effect, aren't you? Maybe we'll throw in some geography or something like that a little bit later and get you a nice little education here. What is one to the 10 to the 17th power? We, well, as an example, 100 is 10 to the second power. All that means is 10 times 10. There's two 10s there in the equation. 10 times 10 is 100, right? So, that, so 100 is 10 times 10 or 10 to the second power. 10 to the 17th power looks like this. So the odds of one man fulfilling eight prophecies exactly as foretold is one in that number, whatever that is. 100 quadrillion, thank you. Pin and ripping upon his chest. Uh, I was going to say quadzillion, you know, because that just sounds funnier. Um, but uh, it's a lot. This, can we just say that? <laughs> it's a lot. Um, it's bigger than our national debt, <laughs> and that's a lot, <laughs> right? It's a lot bigger than our national debt. Okay, that's just eight prophecies. Well, maybe you don't understand numbers. That still doesn't impact you. Let's do the old silver dollar thing, right? You've heard this before. I'm going to do it again. You take a silver dollar and mark it with an X. Put a big X on it. Now, take enough silver dollars to stack them two feet high across the entire state of Texas. Now, all right? Silver dollar, entire state of Texas. Can you imagine the entire? That's a big state, by the way. I've driven across it in uh, the U-Haul. It goes on forever, especially when you need gas. <laughs> when you're running out of gas, it seems like you're going across an expanse of eternity. Let me tell you, uh, you get out there in a no man's land, especially. But uh, okay, so you got the you got the picture: silver dollars stacked two feet high across the entire state of Texas. Now you take one silver dollar, mark it with an X, throw it in the mix, mix it up, blindfold somebody, and tell that person go into the state, wait in there, and with one pick, pick the X. Pick the, the silver dollar with an X. That is literally a word picture of what the odds are of one man fulfilling eight prophecies exactly as foretold. All right? All right, that's a little mind-blowing. Well, let's continue a little bit. Let's go on to 48 prophecies. The chance that one man could fulfill 48 prophecies is this number, 1 in 10 to the 137th power. What in the world is that? 
Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like this. <laughs> that, yeah, I, trust me, I counted the zeros about three or four times to make sure I got that right. That's what that looks like. It's 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Go ahead, Greg. What's the name of that number? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. How about that? Okay, now, since I'm into word pictures, can I just say that that number is the approximate number of the known electrons in our universe? Okay? <laughs> now, you take that same person, blindfold them, and say, all right, go into our universe, if you could do that. I mean, you know, this is our universe right here. You know, what are the odds that you'd walk into this room and pick one electron that was the one with the X on it, right? And now I'm expanding that out to the entire known universe. Pick that electron that, I, that is, has an X on it. That's the odds of 1 and to the 10 times 10 to the 157th power. That's the odds of one man coming and fulfilling 48 prophecies exactly as foretold over hundreds and thousands of years. Amen? Well, I want to, I'm here to tell you that he didn't come to fulfill eight prophecies. He didn't come to fulfill 48 prophecies. He fulfilled over 320 prophecies exactly as foretold. Amen? Now, I don't even know what that number looks like. Don't ask me to put that, uh, put that on the screen because we don't have enough room for all those zeros. But 328 or 320 over 320 individual prophecies of what the Messiah would look like, how he would come, born of a virgin, all of the, everything, uh, to Bethlehem, on and on and on, right in, riding into Jerusalem in a, on a donkey, on and on and on. There's 320, over 320. He fulfilled them all exactly. Didn't miss a detail, amen? Can I just say Jesus is the Messiah? Can we establish that in this room here today? Did I just say Jesus is Lord, huh? Can we say that? Jesus is Lord. All right. So I'm not at the wrong rally then, right? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Guys, people say there's no such thing as a sure thing, you know. Vegas talks about the sure thing, you know, the bet, bet odds, you know, odds and betting and all of that. It is a sure bet, you know. Well, there's no real sure bets in life except this. I can tell you that. This is a sure bet. Jesus is exactly who he says he is. And I just submit to you that if Jesus is who he says he is, then you must do something with him. You get what I'm saying? You don't just blow it off and go, yeah, yeah, Jesus was a good man. No, no, no. Who, what are you going to do with Jesus? Before you answer that, I want you to see what he himself said about himself in John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. <laughs> he said those words. So I just submit to you that he, he was everything he said he was or he wasn't. There's no middle ground. He said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Wow, Jesus, chill out, man. That's not exactly politically correct talk these days, is it? You know, that's kind of... You know, it's kind of closed-minded, isn't it? I mean, these days, man, you know, that could almost be considered hate speech, <laughs> right? And in fact, that's one of the things that the critics love to point out about Christianity and really any world religion, that, you know, they think that they're the right ones. Everybody thinks they're right. Well, somebody's got to be right. <laughs> Can I just say that? If there is no absolutes, then this world then really, I mean, really, can I break it down? Can I get a little philosophical with you for a moment? If there are no absolutes, then why have laws? Who says, who says murder is against the law? That just, that just works for you, you know? I, I don't think murder is against the law. I don't think it's wrong at all. In fact, you know, it's all relative. It's all squishy. What's good, what's good for you is not necessarily good for me. And we have that times 9 billion people in the world. Can you imagine the chaos you say, well, you know what? Gravity, in fact, gravity is calculable, isn't it? 32 feet per second per second. I told you I nerd out on this stuff. That's the gravitational pull of gravity. You know, gravity's a real downer. <laughs> but you know what? We think, we, we literally calculate velocity. We calculate forces. We calculate things based on physical forces that are in place. 
And even the scientific world admits, yes, these things are in place. One of the laws of thermodynamics says you can't, that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Yet we have the same scientific world saying that this all that we know was created by some kind of Big Bang. Well, where'd the Big Bang come from? Well, you know, antimatter and matter came together and particles and us. Well, where'd the particles come from? Well, we had explosions, blah, blah. Well, where'd that come from? They can never answer the basic question. There's got to be absolutes in this world. Otherwise, this whole thing would spin into orbit and there'd be absolute chaos. We wouldn't even exist. Gravity does exist. That's why I can walk. Did you know that when you walk and when you drive your car, it's all based on gravity? Your, your engine, your, your engine's moving. Your, it's transferring torque to your wheels. Your wheels are creating friction on the road that propels you forward. That's all based on gravity. If there are no absolutes, then it's like, hey, man, whatever, right? I'm just saying. There's got to be some kind of truth, Amen. Here's the thing, guys. I, I don't want to hear that Jesus was a good man. I don't want to hear that he was just one way. I don't want to hear that he is just one in a, in a group of a, of a hundred other ways to kind of find yourself and find some kind of peace and meaning in this world or maybe even find God. We live in a world of relativism, relativism and universalism, don't we? Don't we? And, and this kind of talk is closed-minded to the world that we live in. We live in a world where the words love and empathy have been hijacked to fit some kind of narrative, right? We live in a world that, where there's nothing solid and sure. Man, all we have to do is look at the news to see that. But I want to tell you, I don't need a narrative. I don't need a soundbite that's going to make me feel good and scratch my itching ears. Amen? Amen? I need something solid. I need something that I know I can stand on. And listen, I believe... This much I do believe. I believe that Jesus came to show the love of the Father. I believe that Jesus loves us more than we could ever understand. I believe that he accepts us more than we could ever hope to be accepted by another person. Amen. I do believe that. I believe that. That's, that's why it's grace, right? Grace. God's free, freely given, unmerited favor given to us when we deserved the, quite the opposite. But I believe also that this love and acceptance of Jesus is not necessarily a love and acceptance of all of our decisions and our lifestyles. That's something else this world needs to hear. Yes, and that, this is going to be recorded and it's going to be posted on our, on our website and I may get some flack for that. But you know what? That's all right. All I can do is bring what I believe is the truth of the Word of God here. And I'm not getting political here. I'm telling you what, guys. We need to have a biblical outlook on this world that we live in. Our worldview should be the worldview of a Christian in light of the fact that we are in the end times and the time is short. I do believe that. Jesus didn't hang around with sinners to show his tolerance. He did it to show them the way back to the Father. Amen? And he drew you. He didn't say to me, hey, Chris, you know what? You're, a, you're an alcoholic. You've destroyed your life. It's all good, man. You know, you just need that to get through the night. It's all good. You know, do what you need to do. Do your thing, man. I love you. You know where I am if I need you. But wouldn't that be easy if that's the way it was? No. Just ask. I wish I had time to go and share the story with you about the woman in the book of John caught in adultery. Amen? I mean, he showed her love and compassion, right? Read about it. It's in John 8. I believe. And um, he showed her love and compassion. He said, where are your accusers? Remember, remember that story? He's the one that said, you know, let those with, who are without sin cast the first stone. And all the accusers, you know, which is the uh, holier-than-thou people, the judgmental people, you know, that's the allegory. That's the picture there. They all left because they knew they weren't perfect. And Jesus now is sitting with this woman. And we love the story up to this point. He says, where are your accusers? And he, she said, I have none. He said, I, neither do I accuse you. Okay, great. So far, whoo, all right. Then he says, what does he say? Now go and leave your life of sin. See? The world doesn't like that part. 
There's love and acceptance, absolutely. See, we want to water Jesus down. We want to make him palatable to what we want to keep on doing. We want to have one foot in heaven and one foot in the world in, in our flesh I'm talking about. But you can't put Jesus in a box. He is everything he said he was or he is nothing, amen? In fact, let's just show that on the screen because in, put it in print, it must be true, right? <laughs> if Jesus wasn't everything he said he was, then he was nothing. Either was he was everything he said he was or he was a liar. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If he wasn't that, then what is he? He's a liar, right? Maybe a con artist, right? Maybe a madman. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you guys, Jesus wasn't a way. He was the way. <laughs> Amen. He was the son of God. He literally was the only begotten son. The, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was like us in every way, but yet without sin, the Bible says. He left his heavenly prerogatives and took the humility of becoming human and being just like us. He left all of that glory. He left it all behind to be like us, to identify with us so that we can now find our identity in him. Amen? Amen. He was the son of God. He was all God. He was all man. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. He is the Rose of Sharon. He is the Lily of the Valley. He is a bright and morning star. He is the fairest of 10,000. He is a wonderful counselor. He is a mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He's a Prince of Peace. He's my Redeemer. He's my Savior. He's my risen King. And he's my best friend. Amen. Amen. Jesus beat impossible odds and fulfilled every single prophecy spoken about him. Not one detail was missed. And really, when you think about a prophecy, what is a prophecy? A prophecy is a promise from God. That's exactly what a prophecy is. And the Bible says in Christ, all of God's promises are yes and amen. He came to fulfill God's promises. Okay. All right. Let's take a breath. So what? Maybe we want to say, so what at all this? Okay, this has been moving, but uh, so what? Well, I'm here to tell you guys that they're, that as sure as all of this is that I have just laid out to you, this same Jesus is surely coming back on a white horse with fire in his eyes. <laughs> He's coming back on a white horse with fire in his eyes. I said a few weeks ago, and I'll say it again, Jesus is returning soon to reward the faithful and judge the unfaithful. And that's a promise. That's a sure bet. And you can bank on it. So the question is, will you be ready? I said before, Jesus fulfilled over 300 individual prophecies, every single one of them, not one left to question. So I want to ask you, given the odds, are you ready to bet against it? It's a good question. Or will you make Jesus your Lord? Because again, I say, guys, time is short. Time is short. There is nothing, man, there's a lot of things that are important. You know, we're in different phases of our lives. And, you know, I'm, 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 I'm 60 now, so, you know, I, kinda, I have different things that are important to me now than, than they were when I was in my 40s, you know, and, and my 30s. And, but I want to tell you guys, there is nothing, no matter what age you are, there is nothing more important than making sure that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen? And that you are ready for his return. Amen? I'm just going to put it bluntly. Don't die without knowing this. I don't usually talk that bluntly to you. You know that. But I, this is important. Don't die. Well, I got time to deal with this. Oh, really? You think you're sure about that? The Bible says nobody, nobody knows their day. Nobody knows their time. But for everyone, there is a time appointed to die. And then what? The judgment. The judgment. <laughs> I mean, nobody knows. I, I mean, I, I, I use this analogy now and then. But it just struck me when my brother, my older brother, died several years ago. And I found him. I'm the one that found him. An aortic aneurysm. He didn't even have time to take off his glasses. You don't know. And it struck me. That's how death is. Just like that. Just like that. He, he just literally was there in his desk where I found him. And he just slouched over, still had his glasses on. He didn't have time. He didn't have time to do the sinner's prayer. 
He didn't have time to get his act straight. He didn't have time to go through and make some amends and all that kind of stuff. You know, those things we want to do, get our act together. You don't know. So I'm asking you again, do you, is, it, is it worth taking that chance? So right now, I don't usually do this in the middle of a message, but I'm going to do this right now. I'm going to take a pause. And I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes and bow your head so there's no looking around because this is a personal decision. And those of you that are going to be watching the recording, you can do this at home, and I want you to know, even though I'm not there with you, you can do this, and you can pray this prayer. Here's the thing. If you don't know where you would be, if you, if, where you would spend eternity if you were to die today, you can know that, and you can settle the matter right now. Amen? Amen. And so I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But the reason I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes is because I'm going to take that up a notch. And I'm going to ask... If you're not sure, there's no condemnation from me. I'm the only one that's going to see you, you, me and the Lord. But if you're not sure, 100% sure of that, and you want to make sure of that, just raise your hand. Yes, I see the hand. Yes, okay. All right, bless you. Let's pray. I'm going to read, lead you in a prayer, and everybody can pray this. Father, forgive me of my sins. I invite your son Jesus into my heart as my Savior and as my Lord. I'm glad that I will spend eternity with you. And I am yours now. Hallelujah. Hey, amen. That's as, it's as simple as that. Amen. Did you know the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when one person comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Right now, I believe there's a rejoicing going on in there in, in heaven, I'm telling you. And if you've been around for a while like me, you've been serving the Lord, it is always a good time to, at these times like this, to say, you know what, God, cleanse me, Lord. God, purge me, Father. Get my act straight. Get my mind straight, Lord. I've been focused on too many things of this world, Lord, and I've gotten my, my eye off the prize, Lord. God, refocus me, Lord. I recover commit myself to you today. It's a good things to do, guys, because again, I say, guys, as sure as Jesus came and fulfilled every single prophecy without error, that same Jesus is going to rapture his church. And it will be too late at that point. And that, too, is a promise that you can bank on. Then there will be seven years of tribulation, like we've been talking about. Then this same Jesus will bind Satan, the deceiver, for a thousand years. Jesus really is the Messiah, and this is really going to happen. <laughs> Amen. And that's a promise you can bank on. Twyla talked about that a little bit last week because my wife and I were in Seattle area visiting our two-year-old granddaughter that was, a, was having a birthday. So precious. Twyla did a good job. I won't re-preach that, but let me just say, What's that all about? Satan will be bound for a thousand years. The Bible says that an angel will literally take a chain and bind him and throw him into the abyss for a thousand years, which is, the, which is the, another way of saying that it's a bottomless pit where he can't crawl and his crawl, crawl and wake his way out. And why? What's the purpose of that? So that he cannot deceive anyone for a thousand years. That's really going to happen. And, um, and that happens at the end of the, of the uh, seven-year tribulation. These aren't metaphors that we're talking about. These aren't word pictures. These aren't allegories. This is all true. As sure as the morning sunrise, Jesus really is the Messiah, and he really is coming back soon. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay, so let's pick it up. What happens after the seven-year tribulation and Satan being bound? Well, what happens is, is that Jesus will rule the earth during the millennium, and it will be a time of peace and prosperity. The temple in Jerusalem will be restored, and we will reign with Jesus. Amen. Can we just say this together? I will reign with Jesus. I will reign with Jesus. I'm on the winning team. That's why I said that in the beginning. Amen. Again, we're not talking about figurative talk here. This, these aren't bedtime stories. We really will reign with him for a thousand years. Amen. And that, my friends, is an awesome promise that you can bank on. It's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. That's uh, bad grammar, good theology. <laughs> so in our discussions of the end times, we're at the millennial reign now. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the millennial reign of Jesus.
That's what that means. It's a thousand year reign after the tribulation, after Satan is bound for a thousand years. Revelation 26 puts it this way. Blessed and holy are those who share in this first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, and they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. <laughs> just lest you think I just made that up. That is right there in the Bible, and you can bank on it. Amen? So let's unpack that. What is this first resurrection? I want to make this practical for you. I want you to understand. I'm going to try to do my best to explain these terms as we're going through this. What is the first resurrection, and who are they that share in it? Well, the first resurrection refers to all those who died in Christ before the millennial reign. That's, that's why I kind of hit on that a little bit last week. I won't spend a whole lot of time on that, but that's really what it comes down to. Who is that? Well, actually, it comes in stages. Jesus paved the way. The Bible says that he was the first fruits. He paved the way with his own resurrection. That's addressed in 1 Corinthians 15, by the way, if you want to read about that. Then the resurrection of those who were dead in Christ before the, or uh, during the rapture. By the way, remember, we who are Christians caught up in the rapture, I'm not talking about them. We're, we're already going to be with him, right? Then, then the resurrection of those who were dead in Christ during the, during the rapture. We talked about that already. Then the resurrection of those who actually became believers during the tribulation. Remember, a couple of weeks ago, we actually talked about that briefly, that there will be a few that actually will become believers and make Jesus their Lord during the tribulation. It's hard to believe. It'll be tough, the, the persecution. You think, we're, you think, you think uh, the, the Islamic uh, 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 terrorists, uh, the, the extremist groups that we hear about these days, you think they're rough? That's nothing compared to how it's going to be. We talked about the mark of the beast. You'll have to have the mark on your forehead or your hand uh, in order to buy groceries. But more than that, if you don't take that mark, you'll be persecuted. And we talked about the possibility of, of even something as brutal as, as them literally, because that one of the one of the minister or one of the duties of the false prophet is to go around and look for those people that aren't taking the uh, the mark and aren't worshiping the, uh, the the antichrist and kill them. And so. You could say, well, good, take me out. I'll just, I'll confess my faith to the Lord and take me out. Death is better than all this. Sounds like, it doesn't sound too bad. Yeah, but what about when they don't kill you and they put a gun to your daughter's forehead? You know, how are you going to handle that? You know, that, I mean, that's, I'm using my imagination, but that's, the Bible says this is going to be a horrible time. But there will be a few that, that, that hold firm and they will be part of this first resurrection. Awesome. Then notice in verse 6 it says, the second death has no power over them. What is the second death? Well, it happens at the end of the thousand-year reign, and we're going to get into this more next week, but here's the quick answer. In Revelation 20, later on it says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. I believe that is the, shows the gravity of the situation in that scene where Jesus had sent out a bunch of disciples into the region to minister and work miracles and, and minister in his name. And they were excited. They came back. Hey, Lord, 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 check out all this stuff that we did in your name. Man, this is awesome. They came back with a full report. What did Jesus say to them? Don't rejoice in that. Rejoice first that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That, let's just start with the basics. You know what I mean? You ever, do you ever get up in the morning and when you're in your prayer time, do you ever just get back to the basics and say, Lord, thank you that I don't have to worry about hell. <laughs> Amen? I don't have to worry about this. Lord, thank you that I'm yours and I'm going to spend eternity. If I go before you come back in the rapture, I will instantly be with you in paradise. And if I am around when the rapture happens, I'm going to be snatched up and I'm going to be caught in the air with those first that were dead in Christ. I'm going to see them come out of that grave and I'm going to join them with, uh, with you in heaven. What an awesome thing to get back. I mean, that's the basics, man. Sometimes we just got to keep the main thing the main thing. Amen. But those that, whose name were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life 
And, we'll, and like I say, we'll get into this more next time. Okay. Again, sometimes you just stop and go, wow, man, this is pretty heavy stuff. What kind of, I thought God was a God of love, right? <laughs> what kind of God would, would do something like that? Well, remember, and this is important, hell will not be full of people that God rejected. It will be full of people that rejected God. God did not create us to be puppets. He created each person. Did you know that Hitler was created in his image? That's just hard to believe. But he, every, every human has that, that aspect that we were created in his image. From the moment of, moment of conception, he knew us. But yet, sin entered the picture. And God did not create us to be puppets. He gave, what did he give us? A free will. Amen? And that's why the Bible says, and, and, and I, I have this at my home and a plaque and Choose you this day who we will serve. Rest from me and my house. We will serve the Lord. See, there's a choice. God gave us a choice, didn't he? So, again, it will not be full of people that God rejected, but those that rejected God, there really is a lake of fire, and those who rejected God real, really will be sent there for eternity. And that also is something, unfortunately, that you can bank on. But notice who it is that is spared the second death. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. Can I just say this? And let's just all say it together. Hell has no power over me. <laughs> Amen. I, I've shared that about my own testimony. That my life just fell apart because of alcohol and just a bunch of other stupid things I had been done or doing in my life. Fell apart. And here I am. I had grown up. As in a church, in a uh, in a church, in a Christian home, um, but I found out that being a, being in a Christian home didn't make me necessarily right with the Lord. <laughs> and on that day that that I lost everything, and my, I basically had was at that place where I was going to go one of two ways. I was just going to go down that slippery slope and say, "You think I'm a drunk? You think I'm a liar? You think I'm a con man? I'll show you a drunk and a liar and a con man." Or I could take that narrow, less traveled road. <laughs> And thank God, God gave me the gumption to choose that road. See? And, he did, and you did the same thing. You did the same thing. And so I became sober, and I really gave my life to the Lord all at the same time. And uh, was changing hand over fist just so much every day. The Word of God became, came to life for me. It wasn't a bunch of Sunday school stuff. It was real to me for the first time. I was soaking it up. I was in the church every time the doors were open. But one ex unexpected thing that I noticed in me that I wasn't calculating was the re just the absolute freedom from the fear of going to hell. <laughs> you know what I mean? I wasn't even thinking about that. That was just an added, huge added benefit. But before that, you know what? That's a real thing, man. Because I know I lived a crazy life. And there were many times that I lived through things I should have. Man, I tell you, honestly, I'm not glorifying this. Trust me. Lord, help me with this. But man, when I was doing my thing, there were many, many a day, a morning, I'd wake up and not have any recollection of what the night before. I'd have to go out. You've heard me say this before. I'd have to go out and see if my truck was even still there. And if it was, if it's in one piece. You know? And then my friends would usually later on at some point in time, hey, man, you were crazy last night, man. We're uh, Okay. And I'll miss that stuff. But see, had God had his hand on me even then, I believe. And there's, you know, we talk about grace, but we also need to talk about his providence, which is God's foreknowledge. And he knew, he knew I was going to be standing here today. He knew I was going to give his life. I believe he had his hand on me even when I was shaking my fist at him. So I could stand here today and tell you that he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. The Bible says that. God would that no one should perish, but that all would come to repentance. He's not slow in keeping his promises, as we know uh, the idea of being slow. But he wants everyone to come to a saving knowledge. But he also, in his sovereignty and in his foreknowledge, which means his providence, he also knows who will and will not choose. And I believe he had his hand on you. Amen. How many knows there are probably times in our lives we should have been dead? We should have been dead. We should have been in jail. Who knows what else? And now we can say, 
with a peace and an assurance, I don't have to worry about that second death. <laughs> Amen. Hell has no hold on me. Oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? Amen. <laughs> I love, that's why I love preaching a, uh, a Christian funeral because it's a celebration, really. I mean, we're, we're, we miss the person, of course, and especially if it's someone close. I think that's why they say funerals are really for the living because if that person was a believer, trust me, they're not worried at all about what's going on down there. They're up there at, the, at, the, at ha having a nice big old uh, buffet uh, banquet with, 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 <laughs> with the Lamb of God. Amen? But we, you know, we get together, we have a funeral, we have a memorial service, and we remember them, we honor them, we, we cry a little bit. But the truth of the matter is, the moment they spent, they breathed their last breath on this earth, that very next moment they were in the presence of glory. Amen? In paradise. What a revelation. What a, what a promise that is. And it says, getting back to the millennial reign, it says, again, it says, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, that's a great promise. Amen. So let's get into it. Let's continue to talk about it. What will happen in the millennial reign? This is so cool because this is where some of the last remaining prophecies about the world are going to be finally fulfilled. And that, that's what this is all about. So I just submit to you that the millennial reign is all about God's promises fulfilled. That's what, if you think of anything about the millennial reign, think about that. There's going to be a lot of other cool stuff going on. The temple will be reestablished. Jesus will be worshipped, you know, all that. And we'll get into a little bit of that here in a minute. But that's really what it's all about. Okay, so an expanded definition is, in, um, and this is in the electronic notes if you signed up to get those, uh, the millennial reign is the thousand-year reign of Jesus after the tribulation and before the great white uh, throne judgment of the wicked. During this time, Jesus will reign as king over Israel and all the nations of the world. That will, liter that will literally happen. That's not a bedtime story. That is literally going to happen. He will be here, and he will reign. <laughs> Amen. Thousands of years earlier, this was prophesied in Isaiah this is just one. I could have shown you several scriptures, but I want to keep rolling here. Isaiah 41, uh, 42, 1 says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. So there are three distinctive characteristics about this time that we're going to reign with Jesus in the millennial reign. So here's one of them. During the millennial reign, the world will be at peace. Just imagine that. Did you know that there has never been a time in recorded history of man, recorded history, where there's not been some war or some squirmish going on? There have been times where there was relative peace, like after World War II, you know, there was a time where, but there's always been something. There's always been some squabble. There's always been some fight or some little war. I mean, now look what's going on. We got, we got, the, we got the Gaza Strip, you know, we got just on and on and on. We, how many heard recently about North Korea, you know, engaging and being part of what Russia's doing. I mean, I mean, you look around, there's just always something going on. Not during the millennial reign, though. Isaiah 11 puts it this way, and Twyla referred to this briefly uh, last week, and it says, the wolf, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. Can you imagine? And the young child will put its hand into the cobra's nest. They will neither uh, harm nor destroy on, on uh, all of the holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What, a, what an awesome promise that is. Amen. Secondly, we've already referred to this, so I won't, I won't expand on it. During the millennial reign, Satan will be bound. Okay, so we've established that. The third thing that is a not that's notable about this time is that during the millennial reign, the whole world will worship God. Now, just imagine that. The whole world will worship God. Isaiah 2 addresses that. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established 
as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Guys, can you just, I just use your imagination as to no, no opposed religions out there, no, no atheist, uh, you know, no protests going on outside the temple, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, no news coverage outside of this controversial thing going on inside where they're, you know, daring to worship God as if, if, if that's the only way. None of that silliness that we see today. The whole world will be uh, worshiping the Lord. This is really going to happen, and we will be there for it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay, so today we've been talking about prophecies, promises fulfilled real quickly. What promises will be fulfilled during the millennial reign? There are several, but I'm going to highlight three. Let's talk about the promised land. During the millennial reign, Israel will finally take full possession of the promised land. This is also called the land covenant. It's in Deuteronomy 30, if you want to go back and read that. I just, I just included that reference for you. Well, what is that all about? Well, as we know, Joshua led the Israelites to claim the promised land, right? You think, well, pastor, I, I thought they did that during, in Joshua, uh, in Deuteronomy and, you know, the Exodus and all that with Moses. Well, for the most part they did, didn't they? <laughs> but they didn't do it completely, did they? Israel has never fully possessed all the specific areas that God promised in Genesis to Abraham and in Numbers to Moses. There are areas of present-day Lebanon and Syria that have never been possessed. But this remaining land will be given to Israel as promised by the Lord because they will, for the first time as a nation, be in full obedience to God. See, God, if you read about it, read about it in, in Deuteronomy 30. He told them, hey, if you will just obey me, <laughs> right? This is all yours. It could have been like that from the beginning, but... See, we humans, we always muck it up, don't we? <laughs> we turn a 12-day journey into a 40-year wilderness thing, you know? With our choices and all of that, you know? And I just think of my own life. God would say to each one of us, if you will obey me, if you will just obey me, look, this will be yours. Okay, well, that's going to happen during the millennial reign. Another promise, I'm almost done. The promise to David. This is called the Davidic covenant. Uh, it's mentioned in 2 Samuel 7. What this is all about is that God made a promise to David that his line would never die out and that David's heir would sit on the throne of Israel forever. Well, guess what? Jesus is in the line of David. <laughs> you can read about that in the lineage that's mentioned. You know, the old he begat so-and-so and so-and-so and -so begat so-and-so, you know, all that stuff. And, um, and Matthew specific, specifically. But Jesus is in the line of David, and he is the fulfillment of this promise. Amen? He is the fulfillment of this promise. Lastly, the fulfillment of the new covenant. And this is awesome, because this is where, this is where we come in. He is the fulfillment of the new covenant. First of all, let's take a look at what I'm talking about in Scripture. Jeremiah 31 the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband or a master to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Hey, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. <laughs> Praise God. That's a fulfillment. See, Jesus came to bring the new covenant, right? Right? 
We have the Old Covenant, which was the Old Testament. We, had a, we have all of that that went into that with the priests doing the, the sacrifices, right? And the once a year, the priest would go into the Holy Holies. We all, well, when Jesus came and died for our sins, all of that was fulfilled. Amen? Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. There's nothing else that needs to be done. The, tur the curtain in the Holy of Holies was torn from the top to the bottom. Jesus came to bring the new covenant. And in fact, he said, when he taught, taught the, the disciples how to do the, the Lord's communion, he said, this is the new covenant. I am the new covenant. In other words, it's a new way. It's a new promise. And that new way was that he came with his death and resurrection to reconcile hearts to God. Amen. But we have not yet seen the complete fulfillment of Jeremiah 31 yet. That's what I'm getting at. The Old Testament prophets who spoke of this covenant include Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, and Ezekiel. They all wrote that it will happen and it will be fulfilled in the future. And I just submit to you guys that Israel as a nation has yet to worship Christ as Messiah. That will happen in the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's going to be an awesome thing to see. Oh, there are, there are Jews already. You know, there's, anybody ever heard of that, that group, Jews for Jesus? <laughs> there are many uh, that are, that do see Jesus as the Messiah, but there are still many that don't. They still are believing for that old idea that they had of the Messiah that would come in military might and throw overthrow the government, just like they did, just like they thought at the time. But that will happen. That, it will, that will be an awesome thing that happens in the thousand-year reign of Christ. Okay, Pastor, this is all interesting, but what does this have to do with me? And I'm going to close with this idea, guys. Can I just submit that God is a God of detail? Amen? Every single detail of His promises have already been fulfilled or will be fulfilled. Not one detail missed. Amen? Think of the awesomeness of what we talked about earlier and those, all those zeros on the screen of the odds of uh, one man fulfilling all of that exactly. I think that's pretty cool. Well, do you think that the same God that orchestrated all that can't handle every single detail of your life? Do you think he doesn't have your future? <laughs> do you think he doesn't have your kids? <laughs> do you think he doesn't know the things that are weighing you down? Do you think he doesn't know your worries? Do you think he doesn't know about your unsaved loved ones? Do you think he doesn't know about your fears of the future? Every single detail of your life has already been laid out before him like a tapestry unrolled. Amen. He sees the end before the beginning. He knows the issues you face. He knows what you worry about. He knows your failures. He knows your insecurities. I just want to ask you again, does he not have your life in his hands? <laughs> if he can handle all of this, I can't even imagine. Man, I can't even get my family to leave the house when we're supposed to leave the house. How about you? I, I call it the five stages of goodbye. When we go, seriously, we be packed up, and I'm at the point where I, where I joke around. It's like, well, we just want to announce that we're going to leave a half an hour before we really need to. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> some some men are um, some men are raising their hand or either whispering amen. We can't even get that. Can you imagine trying to orchestrate what God orchestrated and sending His Son? God never once looked down and said, "Oh, uh oh, I didn't see that coming." Wow, I didn't know they would reject reject Him. I didn't know they would crucify Him. This is a little rough, but this in the Book of Isaiah. I just challenge you to read it. Okay, we know Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought him death brought our freedom. Amen? And it was upon him. It should have been upon me. And by his wounds we are healed. That's what the Word of God says. But it also says in that same book, it talked about Jesus it says he was a lamb going to the slaughter. He knew why he came. 
and, I, and this is rough, but, I, but I'm telling you, it's in the Word. It says, yet the Lord wanted to crush him. <laughs> That's hard. I mean, I've read the Bible cover to cover, you know. And when I read that, that verse, that's tough. Like, wait a minute. Wow, that's a little bit heavy. God's son, I thought he loved his son. Absolutely he did. But you know what? He loves us, and that's why he came. He wanted to crush him so he didn't have to crush us. <laughs> he wanted to crush him. Jesus came to suffer so that we no longer have to suffer. He came to die on the cross so that we no longer have to face the heaviness of death. Now we can say death no longer has a sting because Jesus did it. He suffered so that we don't. Every single blow he took was so that I don't have to take those blows. And you know what? Sometimes we're the ones that give ourselves the blows. Amen? Sometimes, isn't that true? And sometimes the greatest bully that we face in our lives is the one staring right back at us in the mirror. Jesus paid the price for that. You don't need to quit. Keep on bashing yourself. Well, I blew it, Pastor. You don't know what I've done. You know what? You put it under the blood of Jesus. And as soon as you do, it's gone. Amen? That's why he came. That's why God sent him. And that's exactly what we see going on. Every single detail of what, what was uh, done was done intentionally so that we could understand today, 2024, that God is a God of details. I want to give my life. I want to give my future. I want to give my concerns. I want to give my anxiety. I want to give my worries. I want to give my finances. I want to give all of that to somebody that actually cares. Amen? Amen. Nobody cares like he does. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word today, Father. Thank you, God, for the message, Lord, that we, we, uh, we drank from a fire hose today, Lord, with all this, with all this information, God. But it's, it's good to understand this. It's good to understand uh, every single detail and understand that Jesus fulfilled every single detail. He is who he says he is, and he will do what he said he will do. Thank you, God, that we can be on that, in that army, Lord. We can be with that, uh, with that group when the, when the roll is called up yonder, Lord. We praise you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. I can only imagine what it 